Stealth technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job, to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host. Today, I am pleased to be talking with Dr. William Carter, a program manager since 2018 in the agency's Defense Sciences Office. We are recording our conversations from our respective homes as we do our parts to slow the spread of COVID-19. Because we are not in a recording studio, you might hear ambient sounds like traffic and birds. Prior to arriving at DARPA two years ago, Bill, as I will refer to him here, was the director of the Materials and Microsystems Laboratory at HRL Laboratories, which was founded in 1948 by the famed billionaire Howard Hughes. In Bill's role at HRL, he focused on new materials for 3D printing, including high-strength metals and ceramics, mechanical systems for the stabilization of platforms, like ones you might find in space, scalable approaches to high-performance anti-fouling and nanomaterial coatings, and micro-electromechanical systems, or MEMS, for position, navigation, and timing applications. Earning his PhD in applied physics in 1997 from Harvard University, Bill's background also includes material science and mechanics, and he has more than 15 years of experience managing government and industrial materials research programs. And here's an accomplishment that reflects Bill's knack for innovation. So far, he has accumulated some 101 issued patents, covering new materials and devices for automotive and aerospace applications, and now he is contributing his drive for innovation at DARPA. William Carter, Bill, thanks for joining me in this conversation. Great to be here. So first, in the interest of transparency, I should let you know that I am a huge, huge fan of material science, which I consider to be an underappreciated foundation of essentially the entire history of technology. So I'm looking forward to hearing how you are taking materials research in new and at times spectacularly fast directions in the programs you are running here at DARPA. And we'll get to that in a bit. But first, I would like to know uh, something about the influences and experiences in your life that turned you first toward physics and from there into materials centric R&D in industry and the government. First, I'm really thrilled that you're a fan of material science. I think it's one of the most exciting disciplines. Uh, it's very interdisciplinary, and it brings folks together from all sorts of different perspectives. And uh, of course, we all have an innate feel for materials, these engineered or natural materials that make up our world and allow us to navigate it. In terms of my background, it probably doesn't hurt that I grew up around the, uh, the world of Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, my father was a physicist at the lab, and my mother was a very adventurous person. She was a nurse by background for the, uh, the Pueblos and the Native Americans in the area. And so I grew up around not only this environment of science in the public interest, in the national interest, as well as uh, you know, a wonderful adventurous spirit. I can remember when I was probably seven or eight, I was gifted a telescope. And the skies in New Mexico are spectacular. And, uh -huh. uh, and you know, just sitting there wondering and, uh, and exploring with that telescope, I think, really ignited the desire to go into science for me. And it certainly didn't hurt that uh, it was in the family. Mm, wonderful. And uh, let's see, in terms of how I got into material-centric R&D, and engagement with the government. So I had the opportunity, and this is, you know, I don't take the opportunity for granted to do summer jobs at the laboratory. And one of those laboratory jobs, summer jobs, was with Dr. David Schifferl at Los Alamos. And uh, he was doing material science at ultra high pressures and high temperatures in diamond anvil cells. And so in high school and through college, I, I was doing real science. And that connected me with the team at Harvard that I joined. And the team at Harvard, of course, you know, allowed me to look at, at material science in a different way. 
I went to the Naval Research Lab and actually switched fields, still material centric, but went from solid state kinetics and phase transformations into surface science and from NRL. Again, and that stands for Naval Research Lab for those who are not that familiar with the acronym. (laughs) Right. The Naval Research Lab, of course, is the corporate research laboratory for the Navy and has that culture. And so it was a really natural transition for me to go to HRL, which was, uh, of course, connected to the Hughes Aircraft Company, as you mentioned, and now is co-owned by Boeing and General Motors. And that's essentially where my connection to materials for cars and airplanes came from. Well, so that gets me to the next question I have, which is, uh, and I usually ask this of those who join me in these conversations, is it's the how did I get to DARPA story? So I I know that HRL has extensive uh, and historic connections with DARPA, but what specifically was your connection there that ended up getting you to DARPA? There was a particular program manager in the Defense Sciences Office uh, about 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, Dr. Judah Goldwasser, who very sadly just passed away due to the pandemic. And uh, Dr. Goldwasser was just a a real visionary and wanted to understand how we could really change our worldview around materials. We've been searching for you know, the next new alloy, the next new way to to pull out of the periodic table, you know, a strong material, a ductile material and so forth that can surpass the materials that we have today. And he asked the question, what if we completely inverted that and said, let's let's try to teach today's materials new tricks? And I had been thinking along the same lines. I was working with a colleague at the time, Dr. Alan Jacobson, thinking about architected materials, essentially intentionally porous materials with designed architecture. And these two visions were were right in line. And so I started working with Dr. Goldwasser. And just a question about the what you mean by architected and, and the scale there. So are you talking about a deliberate uh, structure at the micron scale, you know, which is like sort of the, the scale of even cells or below or or millimeter scale, you know, sort of size of poppy seeds? What, what kind of feature sizes are you talking about? Probably the easiest analogy would be to to tall buildings. If you look as an example, as my favorite example in architecture is the Eiffel Tower. That is an absolutely astonishing structure, you know, 300 meters tall. And the relative density of that structure is on the order of a tenth of a percent. What that means is if I took that 300 meter tall structure and I melted it down, but I kept the same footprint, I would have a solid piece of metal, which is about three and a half inches thick. (laughs) So that's an astonishing, efficient use of matter. And when you look at the architecture of the Eiffel Tower, it is organized. It's hierarchical. You've got, you know, of course, the very familiar swooping structure. But then when you zoom in, you see that it is a truss that is composed itself of trusses. And each of those trusses are composed of a third layer of trusses in some cases. And that architecture is what gives that structure its mass efficiency. And so we we thought, okay, could we translate that idea, that core idea from architecture down into the materials level? And so you can look at architecture at many levels within a material, and nature does this phenomenally well. But when you look kind of where you're going to get the biggest benefit, it is at that sort of micron to 10 micron scale. And the key with all materials is that if you can't make enough of that material for an application, it really doesn't matter. And so scalability is absolutely important. So we were, we at the laboratory were chasing scalability. How can I make a really big structure that is composed of all of these tiny sort of micron scale architected features? And that's where we connected. And then through that program, of course, we, I got to know DARPA, the office got to know me, DSO, and we've been engaged in a long conversation about when I should come over. And, you know, I felt like I had really done what I could at HRL to certainly explore all the career options there, but also to make an impact in different ways, you know, from a scientific perspective, personnel, management, business, engaging with our our LLC members at the time, Boeing and General Motors. And I felt like my, my next really important solid step would be to go to the other side of the table and understand from the government's perspective, what are the drivers where are the really important opportunities and how can materials help with those? And, uh, you know, I was able to come here and start working on some of the hardest and most impactful materials problems for, uh, for the nation. 
well, an exciting turn, I would think, for a material scientist. So thanks for sharing uh, that story. So, Bill, before we talk about the programs you oversee at DARPA, I want to dig a little bit into those 101 patents of yours. For all I know, you you have your 102nd already. But uh, when we can only scratch the surface, I want you to be pretty quick on these. But please give me and our listeners a whirlwind tour of perhaps a few of the patents you personally think are the coolest of them all. (laughs) <laughs> that's it's actually pretty hard to pick um you know which of your children do you, you like them most? all well it doesn't yes. matter then they don't have to be the <laughs> coolest ones just ones you like no I, I think the ones that i'm most passionate about are in the area of of uh safety um and and safety is is you know it's not negotiable that's something that we really try hard to ensure and maximize of course you know you can't you can't foresee every contingency but uh, but there are things we can do from a materials perspective. And uh, this is in particular safety for, uh, for vehicles, for automotive applications. Uh, one really important area that we dug into about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, is smart materials. And these are materials that can adapt. And the concept was, could we enable the vehicle to adapt to a, an incident, you know, a potential collision, you know, pedestrian impact, that kind of thing, to prepare itself to be more effective in providing protection for the people involved, whether it's a pedestrian that's being impacted or a person inside the vehicle. And of those, in, in that sort of category of safety that I'm most proud of and would you know look back very fondly on is around child safety. There was a particular problem, it's a heart-rending problem, of you know, a child trapped in a hot car you know, a busy parent who has forgotten them. And, you know, we really looked hard at what are all the technology solutions we could potentially bring to bear on that problem. And we developed a heartbeat sensor that could uh, <laughs> could hear the heartbeat of a child through, you know, through all the layers of padding in the seat, through the car seat, and just meeting the people involved in safety uh, and, and particular child safety and interacting with them and engaging with them was just a profoundly moving experience. But we might have time for one more patent that comes to mind that you're fond of. For a while, we worked on, of course, these architect materials, and we developed a process to make ultralight materials. And this was under a DARPA program. And it was really, really fun. The fundamental question was, how light could a material be? And, you know, of course, we're intentionally putting porosity in. And in that case, we were able to make a material which was significantly lighter than aerogel. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking of, which, which used to have a name called solid smoke. Yes. <laughs> and when you hold a piece, it, it really looks that way. And so we, we do have a few patents on that. That is a very interesting material. It's, it's potentially very good at acoustic absorption and insulation, where you really want to have minimum weight and maximum interaction. What is the actual sort of material category? Is it a metal or some organic compound? It can be anything. It's, it's more of an architecture. So we, were, we used metals. We also used polymers. Really, really, really very flexible concept. Okay, and then one other thing that came up in an earlier discussion, uh, this goes back actually more toward your earlier years, and you said that you traveled around the world. I think this was often with your mother. I'd like just to describe, you know, briefly something about those travels and maybe what you might be drawing from that even now in your science and engineering endeavors. Oh, gosh. So I think what I draw from that experience, just to start on that point, is being open to serendipity. Let me describe what we what we used to do. We would buy a ticket to some part of the world and then a, another return ticket from a very, very you know distant part of the world and figure out how to get between those two places with no plan. And it was a, an absolutely incredible experience. The first time my mother and I traveled, we went from uh, Helsinki, Finland to Hong Kong uh, the hard way through the old Soviet Union uh, down into China and uh, Pakistan, India, Nepal. And it was just a profoundly life-changing experience. And uh, every year or a couple of years, we were able to make a trip like that. You get a sense of the world, you know, very different people. And yet you can be in a part of the world where maybe they don't know very much about you. And yet they are welcoming and engaging with you as a person. And so I think being open and 
interested in, in engaging with people who are very different from myself is certainly one major lesson. And another is to really learn to listen to ideas that maybe are outside of my experience and try and understand them and figure out how we can take those ideas and build on them. Wow. I mean, I know you got your PhD from Harvard, but I'm beginning to think that the most valuable learning you did was was on those trips with your mother. Wow, what a gift that she gave you and the many kinds of lessons that emerged from that. I'm sure that you're putting those to use now. So, wow, thanks for sharing that. Now, let us move into a discussion about your really interesting portfolio of programs. So let's start with a program called Matrix, or in its long form, the Materials for Transduction Program. Relevant material categories have intriguing names, thermoelectrics, multiferroics, and phase change materials. And their applications also perk the ears. They include control devices, antennas, micromotors, energy harvesting, and even refrigeration, which actually is quite interesting because we need a next generation refrigeration technology to knock down one of the major sources of carbon emission. But that's probably a story we won't get to here. Anyway, tell me about this program, Matrix, the new materials you hope it will lead to and what you hope to achieve. Absolutely. So Matrix is actually a program that I inherited. Dr. Jim Gimlet started the program before I arrived at DARPA, but it's, it's really well aligned with my background in smart materials and smart structures. The core idea of the program was that we've been working on these transductive materials for a long time, thermoelectrics. Thermoelectrics are materials that when you put a temperature gradient across them, you can transduce that temperature gradient into, into electricity. There's you know, other materials that you mentioned, uh, phase change materials, multiferroics. They all, they all do this sort of transductive process. And the frustration in the community for a long time has been, why have these materials not been as impactful as we would like them to be? They have this amazing capability. And you know, why, why aren't we completely revolutionizing thermal management and energy generation? And the core concept behind the program was maybe it's because we have not co-develop the materials along with the application. And you really, you really do need to do that. You need to think about what the application is trying to do, provide, and specifically, you know, provide, say, a few hundred watts for a forward operating base so that devices can be recharged. And to do so at significantly lower masses of, you know, size, weight, and power kind of metrics than what we can do today with, you know, a generator that you might, you might find at Home Depot. So that's the core focus of the program. And I, I think that has really played out in several different aspects. Uh, there's the energy generation that I talked about, portable power. There are several projects that have been co-developing thermoelectrics and then a device to utilize those, those thermoelectrics. Just take me through one or two examples that some of the performers are working on, that is to say the research groups that are uh, on contract on, on the Matrix program, uh, to, to give listeners a sense of, of, in fact, you know, what would such a material look like and what would sort of the signal from the environment be that gets transduced into something else that is useful? Let's take the thermoelectric example. So in this case, the device would look something like a portable gas can canister that you might get for your grill. Think something on that size. And inside of that would be a reservoir for fuel. So think you can pour in jet fuel, JP8, or some other type of fuel. And there's a burner inside. So it converts that fuel into heat. There's a, a you know a hot zone inside of this device. Around that hot zone would be placed these thermoelectric materials. And the thermoelectric, one side of it would be exposed to the hot side. And then there's a heat exchanger or a, uh, a radiator that then couples to the outside, you know, to room temperature or whatever temperature is ambient. That sets up the temperature gradient across the material and starts the flow of electricity. And then you can connect all of those thermoelectric elements up to a power converter. And, you know, then it might have a set of plugs like you would see, uh, you know, for a USB charging device, something like that on the outside. So just a question about that, though. What, what's the advantage of doing that, you know, with these advanced materials versus, say, burning fuel uh, to, to run a, a generator? 
just a basic generator. Lots of people have, you know, puttering around in their backyard when the lights yeah. go out. I think there's two major advantages. One is that we would uh, have a significantly lighter device. So because there's no moving parts, we're not dealing with a lot of the, the mechanics and mechanisms. Uh, it could also be potentially more reliable, potentially. Uh, but I think the other, the other advantage is, is that it would be silent. So, you know, generators are, are, are loud. They, uh, they're, they're smelly. Um, we could we could probably change a lot of that if we were able to, to get this to work. So you can get your electricity without screaming, here I am, here I am, out there in a contested environment. Yeah, right. <laughs> and <laughs> there are potentially, you know, non-military applications. Uh, I think one of my favorites is actually the media. If you have a, you know, a, a portable station where you're trying to interview somebody, the last thing you want is this noisy generator sitting right next to you, interfering with the uh, the audio signal. Ah, right. Well, I'll, I'll have to tell my uh, journalism friends about, about this uh, potential new technology for when they're out in the field. Another deep dive materials program under your wing, and another one I think you inherited from a program manager, John Main, who I got to know in my first tour of duty at DARPA back in the 2016 to 2018 timeframe. It's called the Atoms to Product Program, or A2P. Catch me up briefly on the history of the program and where you are taking it now. Uh, so this is a program I actually had a connection to uh, back when John was formulating the program. So it was a real, a real pleasure to be able to inherit the program and shepherd it through its final year. The core idea behind Atoms to Product was scalability of nanotechnology. And at the time, John was looking at all of these different new techniques for developing nanomaterials with absolutely amazing properties and asking the question, why did we not then see a lot of applications for them? And, and one of the problems is that you need to be able to scale. You need to have a large capability for translating that nanomaterial to the macroscopic application, you know, think the side of a, of a car or, you know, an entire airplane wing. How do I get sort of those nanomaterial properties at that scale? And so he developed this program. Right. You mean, so whereas you might make a pinky nail size sample in a lab, but if you're going to actually apply it to something like the side of a car, how, how are you going to make enough material ultimately that you can afford and is practical? Absolutely. So that was the core question in the program. And when you dig into the science, what you realize is that there's this beautiful balance of forces at the nanoscale that, that allow us to make these nanomaterials. We have, you know, different attractive and repulsive forces, everything from covalent and ionic bonds up to hydrogen bonds, up to Van der Waals interactions. And then we have repulsive forces, you know, hard sphere interactions, materials that, that, that repel each other, say electrostatically, and other forces that cause rearrangement like Brownian motion. Right. And in, in this list of forces, I just want to let readers know who have never heard what Van der Waals forces are. Those are just sort of very subtle forces between molecules. So not exactly as strong as, say, a bonding type of interaction, but a force that does influence the way molecules will interact with one another. Yes. I think the most uh, famous macroscopic example of Van der Waals interactions is the gecko, of course, you know, how the gecko actually can stick to the ceiling. That's a Van der Waals interaction. But those forces, all those forces kind of stop working at about 100 nanometers. And then we have a hard time then doing things with those materials at sizes greater than, say, about a micron until we get to larger sizes where we can start to manipulate things in traditional ways, you know, pick and place, uh, you know, different types of lithography, machining, those sorts of things. So the program was really about bridging those two worlds and enabling us to take advantage of those nanoscale properties at the macro scale. One of the most stunning outcomes of the program is the scalability of collagen production, nanoscale collagen production into a macro scale product that could be a replacement safe for a tendon in the body. Uh, there's a company that we're working with right now that has just received FDA approval to go into clinical trials. I take it you're referring to Embody and their work on the, the yes. ACL? you got it. And what was really core for them was developing processes that allowed them to have the nanoscale collagen fibers, but make them massively parallel and at scale. They did that under the program. Is this actually some kind of synthetic or bioengineered collagen, or is it a completely different material that's able to, to serve the same function that the ACL normally does? They've done both. So they've, they've done a 
I'll call it a composite between bio-derived collagen and a reinforcing fiber, a reinforcing element, which is more synthetic. Uh, but they also have a pure collagen product as well. And these two, I think, are going to be very, very impactful. And I'm, I'm a longtime skier, so I can already feel my knees and my ankles getting ready to want one of these. Ah, so there's a, a, some degree of self-interest in this trajectory of the program, which is really fine. There's lots of skiers and soccer players and many other active people who would love to have a way of repairing their, their ACL. So that sounds very cool. I do, I've do. i heard of another one. I think this Xerox Park is working on something called a, a micro-assembly printer. Yeah, they've done an amazing job. And of course, you know, Xerox has this amazing background in printing of all kinds, and they wanted to be able to take their core, you know, one of their core expertise areas, you know, scale, scalable, you know, laser printing, that kind of thing, and apply it to electronics and be able to produce electronic components as easily as you laser print. I want to just talk about one more program, Bill, and this one is, is your materials, architectures, and characterization for hypersonics, or MOC program. Very clever acronym because MOC refers to the speed of sound and air, but that hypersonic word in the program title indicates that you're working on materials for vehicles intended to travel at least five times the speed of sound, maybe 10, maybe even tens of times the speed of sound. I was just sort of thinking about just how fast that is. And so if you calculate the LA to New York trip of, of a Mach 10 vehicle, which would be traveling at 7,600 miles per hour, which is two miles a second or so, then it would take about 22 minutes to get to LA from say New York. So what are the materials challenges to building vehicles that can operate at those speeds? And what are you doing in the mock program to try to realize those challenges? Yeah, hypersonics is a really fun technology area. It is very driven by the capability of the materials. And there's one feature of a hypersonic vehicle that is absolutely dependent on the capabilities of the materials. And that's the leading edge of the vehicle. This is the part of the vehicle that meets the atmosphere first. We're flying through the atmosphere as opposed to space. And when you're going this fast, the aerothermal heating that occurs when you compress the air ahead of you and the friction of the air against the vehicle is absolutely intense. Just to give you a sense of how intense it is, the heating rate at the front of the vehicle scales as the cube of the velocity of the vehicle. And it also scales as the uh, you know, square root of the free stream pressure divided by the square root of the feature size. In that case, the sharpness of that leading edge. But does this basically mean, just to simplify, does it mean that, that the faster you go, the faster and faster you heat up? Yes. And it's, it's a really hard wall. You know, folks, you know, as they were developing faster and faster aircraft, talked about breaking the sound barrier. Once you get to about Mach 5, we start talking about breaking the heat barrier. This is a thermal problem in addition to an aerodynamic problem. So we have this very hot leading edge. It's very tiny. If you want your vehicle to be aerodynamically efficient, it has to have a very sharp leading edge, as opposed to what you might see, say, for an Apollo reentry capsule or something, you know, where, where we're coming back from space, we're trying to mitigate that heating. Those look very, very, you know, they're very blunt. They're very large and very low curvature. We're essentially trying to do, you know, cut through the air, if you like. So it's about dealing with that heat. And if you go back in the history, it's just this wonderful history of incredibly creative engineering solutions to dealing with that heat. Way back in the 50s, folks were just trying to understand the problem and they did not have great materials to work with. And so they spent a lot of time adding thermal management to that leading edge or to the nose cone of some kind of a vehicle. Then sometime in, this, in the 60s, we discovered a material or we, we developed a material called carbon carbon, a composite between carbon fibers and a porous or lower density amorphous carbon matrix. And this is an absolutely amazing material. If you were going to imagine a single material with all the properties that you would want, this is that material. And it can handle very, very high temperatures. It is composed of carbon, so it does degrade in the atmosphere. You start to oxidize the carbon. Think, you know, a glowing coal that you would have in your fireplace. You know, you blow on it, it glows. But it keeps its shape, at least to some extent, but you can watch it erode as you're oxidizing the carbon. 
that material took us a long way and been using it in a variety of applications for leading edges, you know, the leading edge of the shuttle. When you look at the, the nose and the wing, the black parts of that are all carbon carbon. It's a, again, a really good material, but it only takes you so far. That velocity cubed, that's a hard heat wall. So what happens when you hit that wall, when you start to hit somewhere around, you know, 2200 C, you know, three or 400 watts per square centimeter, then what happens is the carbon starts to burn and that leading edge starts to blunt and the aerodynamic efficiency of the vehicle drops. So you're not able to then have as much range or maneuverability as you would like. And so we're trying to solve that problem is how do we have a leading edge which doesn't change shape and also can take even greater heat. And we've gone back to that history, the pre-carbon carbon history and said, okay, we have new ways of handling heat now. You look at you know, the turbine engine industry, you look at the, the power electronics industry, they're starting to deal with heat fluxes that are on this order. Let's see if we can translate some of their solutions over into new high temperature materials that we can produce in net shape with complex internal architectures, going back to our architecture discussion, that can allow us to have the structure, the uh, strength and stiffness that we need, as well as imbue them with thermal management capability. So, you know, heat, think heat exchangers, transpiration, you know, phase change, that sort of thing. I love the way you described all that because it really helped me appreciate the role that materials will play in the future of hypersonic vehicles, technologies, weapons, in, in the sense that there are other huge challenges. Just let's think about propulsion. <laughs> Um, yes. But but materials will have a, a certainly an important role in, I guess, how long of a flight a, any particular kind of vehicle might be expected to withstand. And, and then, of course, that has all kinds of, I guess, tactical and strategic uh, consequences. And, and then, then it all fascinatingly comes down to the way you put atoms together. Ultimately, it's an interesting continuum there. Indeed. It's a wonderful materials problem. I mean, the community that I'm working with is really just energized. They've, this is a, um, a really hard problem and they're bringing a whole variety of potential new solutions and uh, making great progress. We're about a year, roughly a year into the program and already showing results. We're developing, again, these sort of new materials as well as these new thermal architectures. Now, how many performers do you have on this? Uh, we have nine, nine performers plus uh, uh, partners within on, sort of on the government side. Hopkins APL is a uh, standout partner for us in being able to connect the materials developments with platform performance. Just the fact that you said that there were nine performer groups, that reminds me of one of the things about DARPA that I find amazing in the projects in that a, a, a project like this, like Mach, uh, that brings together a number of different performers, different research groups, it's sort of a way that, a, that an R&D community and an innovation community gets created by way of the existence of the project itself, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Bill, before we leave Mach, as we're getting into the sort of the tail end of our discussion, were there any other things about that program or about uh, hypersonic technology that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention there was one vehicle in the dark, deep dark past called the Boost Glide Reentry Vehicle, which flew a year before I was born and had one of these types of technologies on it. So this is very much back to the future. It had a nickel nose cone, which was cooled using transpiring water and had, uh, you know, a few like 20 or 30 kilograms of water on board to help it survive. Amazing, though, because what that means is that the engineers were stealing from the plant world, yes. <laughs> right? Because trees rely on transpiration to bring water up from the roots all the way up to the tops of their canopy. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to hear that engineers are, are honoring the brilliance of biology to uh, bring into something even like hypersonics technology. That is so cool to hear. And I guess just one more question. Is there anything that didn't come up during our conversation? Are you appalled at me for not asking a, a question that I absolutely should have? Uh, and if there is a question like that, let me know what it is and, uh, and then you answer it. If I was going to just add one thing to our conversation, it's that I have absolutely unbounded optimism about the potential for science to solve today's most important problems. And I think material science can contribute 
uh, you know, there's, there's a feeling that we've been at material science almost for the history of our species. And we've unlocked as much of the periodic table as we can potentially unlock. I, I don't think that's true at all. I think we have barely scratched the surface. We've looked at the problem from a, you know, one perspective. How do we put atoms together? We've tried to look at it from another perspective. You know, how do we have an application drive our, uh, you know, the performance of the material that, uh, that we would like to produce? There's a whole new world of you know, certainly artificial intelligence, machine learning. These new tools can be applied to that very old problem. And I believe we will find profoundly impactful new solutions. That's, that's one. And I think the other is really about people. I feel material science is a wonderful field. It brings people together from chemistry, physics, engineering, the end user community, and you know, all the different engineering disciplines, you know, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so forth. And I think we have a whole new opportunity to rethink this field. So instead of having us all be in our different silos, we have, through some of these new tools, the ability to now get back together and work as a team. I just want to leave you with that message, that I really have unbounded optimism about the future of materials and the future capabilities that will come out and the ability of those capabilities to solve some of our, our hardest problems. Mm, well, we so badly need more and more optimism. So thank you for giving me that uh, that uplifting kind of finale. And I just have to say, I love the way you're thinking about the periodic table. Every material that ever was, is, or will be is sort of inherent in that. And yet what you say is we, we're, we've only mined it uh, in, in a very minor way. And so by bringing all these this interdisciplinary sort of mindset to it and all the new skills and the tools, we're just at the beginning of maybe bringing out materials that can solve a lot of our, our problems. And, uh, and, and that is a very optimistic message to me. So I'm really happy that you're on it. You're, you're on this task, uh, Bill, and, and I think we're, we're all better for it. Thanks, William Carter, Bill, as I've been calling you, for letting me and listeners in on what the future of materials and the advances in technology they enable might look like. Uh, so, so just thanks for this discussion. Absolutely. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. Thanks also to Ben Sullivan for his partnership in producing this program. For more information about Dr. William Carter, the programs he runs in the agency's Defense Sciences Office, and the other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website. <laughs>